Well, 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 well. If it isn't a lover's quarrel like I've never seen, James Harden, the Philadelphia 76ers are in a standoff. The Portland Trailblazers won't let Dame go. We The, the guys are having a tough time, Liv. Happy Friday. They I are. miss your face. I miss you more. We're totally twinning. We did not plan it, everybody. This was did an absolute coincidence. <laughs> We're just twin flames, and this just proves it. All yes. right. This just proves it. Listen, we got to dive into this NBA news. We'll start yes. and go ahead with Dame. No news is sometimes good news. In this case, it is not. The Portland Trailblazers are reportedly still refusing to adhere to his trade request, which, of course, is to Miami. Um, they're, they're playing hardball and Dame is not budging it. He has said via his agent that he will show up to training camp, um, come October, end of September, but that he still very much so wants to be traded to Miami. Now, Dame just dropped a new album and Bam Adebayo showed some support on Instagram and Dame showed the love right back, giving Heat fans and Trailblazers fans a frenzy. But I mean, I mean, Dame. Liv, what do you make <laughs> of this standoff between the Trailblazers and Damian Lillard? We kind of knew that this was going to be the case, but we're approaching of September. And if yeah. you remember the Donovan Mitchell situation around September or September is when he was officially traded to Cleveland, but it looks like Portland's not giving up anytime soon. How do you think this turns out? No, yeah, they, they seem pretty set in their ways in terms of not wanting to trade Damian Lillard, but I just have to ask the question, why? Like, what do mm. you gain from keeping an unhappy, your best player is unhappy. What do you gain from keeping him there? You're not gonna get the best out of Dame if he's not happy in his environment. We know how often these athletes uh, talk about the environment that they're in. Now, I think the, di yeah. the largest difference between a guy like Harden and a guy like Damian Lillard is James Harden bullies his way out of contracts and Damian Lillard does not. Now, should Dame maybe start trying to do the same? Maybe that's what it takes is for him to get a little bit mean, but we know that's just not who Damian Lillard is. Uh, I just don't know what the point is of having an unhappy player. They don't gain anything from that. Uh, I'm very interested though to see how this plays out because we're, I know we're going to touch sure. a little bit on the NBA schedule. The only TNT game next season for Portland is versus the Miami Heat in Portland on February mm -hmm. 27th. And that yeah. happens to be a few days after the trade deadline. So depending on what happens here, which I don't think anything will. I think that if yeah. something was going to transpire, it would have happened already. I'm very interested about that February 27th game because again, he's not happy. Let him go. Just right. free day. I'm, I'm under the belief that February he'll be in, my, in a Miami Heat jersey. I think it's going to happen. I just think it's going to happen on the Trailblazers time schedule, which when you think about it is icky because we're not talking about a James Harden who we'll touch upon in a second. We're talking about Damian Lillard who has shown a tremendous amount of loyalty to this organization, yes. almost to a fault. Like to the point where yes. NBA fans were almost begging for him to request his way out of Portland and he stayed the course I feel like as long as it made sense for him and now you know it's almost an unspoken rule in the NBA that when a superstar requests a trade you are supposed to adhere to that trade and it it definitely is icky and definitely rubbing people the wrong way that Dame's trying to do things the right way and Portland's not is backfiring it's backfiring yeah. but speaking of doing things the right way, the opposite of right is wrong. And here's James That's Harden. Right. <laughs> we started the show off yes. with that clip of James Harden. We can't forget the infamous clip of him in China calling Daryl Morey a liar, not once, but twice. But the man twice. knew his audience. Yes. Listen, the man yes. knew his audience because he knows that China cannot stand that man. He knew exactly who to go to. Now, some tidbits of information have come out and circulated and depending on what you believe or don't believe, I'm right in the middle. It appears that James Harden, and I said initially when this came out, it was either a trade issue or it was a money issue. The fact that Joel Embiid and PJ Tucker are both backing him up makes me believe it's a money issue. And now it came out that Daryl Morey allegedly promised James Harden money this off season. If you remember last off season, he took, um, you know, he restructured his deal to help the 76ers out. Apparently Daryl Morey went ahead and, you know, agreed to go ahead and compensate him the following season. 
That has not happened yet. James Harden's looking for a max deal. The 76 ers said, mm, and now Daryl Morey is a liar. So where do you stand on this in, on this saga? Because I will tell you where I stand after I hear your answer. I mean, to me, it feels a little bit like the boy who cries wolf. And at this point, James Harden may be accurate. Daryl Morey probably is a liar. And there's probably a lot of shady things going on yeah. behind the scenes. But we've seen this story before. We've seen James Harden bully his way out of a contract because he's not satisfied. I feel like at this point, he's a negative Nancy. He's never going to be satisfied. So it's hard when you've got a situation where you've got teammates that are backing him up. So there's obviously some truth to what he's saying. But I think it's like same thing different years so i'm i'm kind of mm. over the james harden um you know po it's it's always in this off season where we see that he's not happy with either money or he doesn't think he can win a championship where he's at i would just love to know what james harden wants because if it's money that you're after it doesn't right. seem like the clippers are really willing to step up and pay you what you deserve they're not super eager to get this handled and to pay you what you right. what you seem to want. If money's the issue, I'm not sure Clippers is the answer. If winning a title is what you want, you're probably in the best possible spot to make that happen. You've got an MVP caliber player on your side and you're in the Eastern Conference. I think it's a lot easier to win a championship in the Eastern Conference right now if you're a James Harden. So again, right. what does he want? And there probably is truth to what he's saying. But when we've heard this before, again, it feels like the boy who cried wolf every season no absolutely i agree <laughs> there's truth to what he's saying i i feel like listen chris paul had the same issue when he was in houston he said that he meaning daryl morey said he wasn't going to trade him and then what happened a few days later or a week later he was in okc um in some way shape or form this is similar to the ben simmons situation although obviously the foundation is different daryl morey was a person mentioned in that story numerous times so do i think daryl yep. morey has a habit or a reputation of saying one thing and doing another yes does that make him a liar yes does that make him a hypocrite yes now, I can understand James Harden going into the 76ers offseason last season with good faith. Listen, I want to be here. I want to help you guys, you know, restructure my deal, take the money in and do what you need to do with it. But then what happens? Then a season happens. The playoffs happen. James Harden gives us one good game. And in game six, game seven, completely disappears while Joel Embiid is not only dealing with an injury, comes back and is still dealing with an injury and fighting for his life, fighting for the team to his best of ability. So if you're the front office, that's the lasting memory that you have. Yeah, I know what of I course. told you. And when you think about it in terms of morals, if I tell you something, should I honor it? Yes. Now, when you think about it in terms of business, if I tell you something and you don't yep. hold up your end of the bargain, I know what I said, but how does that benefit me? My of critique course. of James Harden has been, he seems to still maneuver in a superstar mentality without superstar results. We can say a lot about LeBron James and we do, but LeBron <laughs> is given certain um, he, he's given a way to maneuver with his teams. He's given he's given certain privileges because yep. he brings results. He brings wins. It. He brings playoffs. He brings championships. James Harden, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Well, I think there's a level of entitlement as well. I think, and that's kind of what you're what you're talking about here is that there's a level of entitlement that yes, Daryl Morey should not have gone back on his word, but also. Um, the league is getting more and more talented. And while he's had superstar right. seasons before, hey, if I'm going to pay you right now, what am I going to get from you right now? And I think there is an entitlement of, I deserve the money. I need to have the money. He's not giving me the money. He's a liar. Well, mm -hmm. did you hold up your end of the deal? Yeah, I think there's entitlement with, with Harden for sure. So we see in that clip, you know, the question is asked, do you think that the relationship between you and the 76ers or Daryl Morey um, Daryl Moore and the 76ers rather is beyond repair. He says, quote, I think so. Now we've heard this story before, Liv, not with James Harden, yep. but with athletes across the board. They say a relationship's beyond repair and then they go ahead and get that contract and that money that they're looking for and bygones are bygones and, and money makes a lot of things better. Do you think that the 76ers cave before James Harden does and if one of these parties caves before the other, what is the outcome? Does James Harden get get his deal 
Or does he get his money, but not in the deal that he's expecting? Does he get traded? If so, where is he going? How does this play out? Because it's reported he's not going to show up to training camp and he's going to, quote, make it as co- uncomfortable as possible for the 76ers. So use your imagination what that means. <laughs> You know what? I think at this point, you we have a lot of these leagues and management and owners really looking at these teams from a very different lens. And that is, mm. um, are you worth the headache? From a business perspective, we want to win. Um, we want to drive revenue to this franchise. We want to have a, it's not just about the right here, right now. It's also about the next five, 10 years of this program. Um, I don't right. think James Harden is worth the headache. And I think at this point, he may have to deal with Daryl Morey being a liar, or he may have to play overseas. I think he is at a position wow. in his career had he made these comments and been this frustrated with the 76ers five years ago maybe maybe he's worth the headache but James Harden's getting older and we're seeing a little bit of regression in his game and we're seeing a lot of inconsistency in his game so is he worth the headache I personally don't think so I think him opening his mouth was a good thing to do for the sake of the future of any franchise that is under Daryl Morey but I think for James right. Harden he may have just affected his long longevity in the NBA right and listen this is not to knock James Harden's legacy hall of famer gonna go into not not knocking that at all but I agree with you it's definitely again what have you done for me lately league it's a lot it's the recent memory league like nobody remembers what you did 10 years ago everyone remembers what you did yesterday and the unfortunate part is James Harden hall of fame career one of the best to ever do it. One of the best ISO ball players I've ever seen. But lately we are seeing a James Harden who is yeah. selfish, but doesn't give results. So everyone's going to be looking into the situation, keeping an eye on the situation. Joel Embiid, I mean, the process may not be processing anymore. I don't know. He took it off well, his, his, took it off his bio, but it's still on his banner on Twitter. So I don't know quite what that means. And you bring up a great point about his legacy, because I don't want to make it sound like James Harden isn't an an exceptional player, because he absolutely is. I think the biggest thing is, and it was very eye-opening for me when a while ago, before Summer League, in fact, James Harden making comments about not wanting to stay in Philly. Why weren't teams lining out the door to acquire Mm. a guy like James Harden? When you look at his resume and his accomplishments and what he has done for teams that he has been on, There should have been plenty of teams in this league going, okay, I want James Harden. He wants out of Philly. Let's figure out how to make this work. And there weren't teams like that. In fact, he expressed interest in Houston and Emei Udoka said, it's not going to work here. So to me, very eye-opening, very telling that you've got very little teams stepping up to acquire Harden and the teams that he is showing interest in don't really seem to be reciprocating that same energy. So again, it's... it's, it's it's Makes one-sided, you Liv. And I mean, listen, you mentioned Houston. Let's mention the Clippers real quick. I mean, could the Clippers utilize James Harden? Absolutely. Do they need him? No, but it would be James Harden has this grass is greener mentality where he's always, always looking across the fence and seeing what looks like the easier, what looks like the sexier, what looks like the better option. But let's call a spade a spade. Kawhi Leonard is a question mark. Paul George is a question mark. Always. There's always going to be something that happens either with both of them or one of them at some point in the season. If you are the Clippers, you saw what James Harden did when Joel Embiid went down. And what he did was basically a lot of nothing. Is that somebody you want to go ahead and trade players for and move pieces around? Because you know when his back is against the wall, if it's not going his way, he doesn't care. And Mm -hmm. if it is going his way, you can't always depend on it. I don't do that. I don't blame them for not making that move. So we will see how this plays out if if James Harden's in a uniform come the start of the season. But speaking start of the season, the NBA schedule was released yesterday and basketball fans everywhere rejoiced. So um, what did you make of this release? What games are you looking for? I know you got a few. Yeah, I'm excited about a couple matchups, mostly for former players seeing their old teams. I'm very excited to see a Dylan Brooks um, running his mouth to his old teammates who probably don't have, now they're not Mm. forced to put up with him. They don't have to be patient or put on a brave face for him. So I would love to see him go after it with a guy like John Moran. I I just don't think that it's going to go over as smoothly as he's used to. You've got the Webin Yama debut that's happening October 25th. 
Smith. I think a lot of people are excited to see what he looks like on this level. Obviously, yeah, summer league, sure. he had some great moments, but it's a whole lot different when you're going up against starters and veterans who have been in this league for a very long time. Uh, I'm excited about the Draymond Green Jordan Poole reunion. I think that messy. is something to look out for. Very mm -hmm. messy. I mean, Jordan Poole, I have given him credit many times for the silence that he has taken with all of the Draymond Green drama. You know, he could have yeah. exposed Draymond Green and dragged him through the mud a long time ago. He didn't. But now he doesn't have to keep that smile on his face and be chummy with his teammate. They are no longer teammates. Um, and one that you might be excited that I'm excited about is Knicks Bucks, December 25th. I am this very day. excited about this Knicks yeah. team this year. I am. I know I give you crap for your Cowboys, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> I will make up for it with my support for the Knicks because I'm very, very excited to see what they do this season. And I think the Bucks, to me right now are probably the contender in the East. But interestingly Ooh. enough, they've got a very weird little matchup here where this, uh, I'm going to name some teams, the Celtics, Sixers, Heat, Nuggets, Suns, Lakers, Warriors, Clippers. So best teams in the league right now. They face okay. only four of those teams in their first 35 games. So we may see a Bucks team that's got a really beautiful record at the beginning of the season, but then mm. they face 16 of those teams in their final 45. So I think there's going to be a lot of you know, they reel you in and make you feel really good about what they're doing. But then the the second half of their schedule gets pretty tough. Yeah. Um, so they may start with the best record in the NBA, this Bucks team. That's going to be my little yeah. hot take. But I don't think we should be fooled too quickly. So I, obviously, as a Nuggets fan, that Lakers Nuggets opener. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. We're going to see the Lakers <laughs> post sweep. I'm sure LeBron James wants his revenge. So there's quite a few matchups I'm pretty I'm pretty stoked about. I feel like the Nuggets and Knicks had like the coolest. I mean, the Pelicans did it their thing too, but schedule release video. I love how the Knicks, you know, showed love to Clyde Frazier. I really, yep. I don't know, I'm feeling what the Nuggets did. It's a little bit of nostalgia. It's very like '90s yeah. cartoon. I, I'm yeah. here for it. I think it, I think it was cool. I, I like it too. Have, I actually have a Nuggets game on my list. Um, I have okay. Nuggets at Suns, something that I'm looking forward to. You know, Suns fans, you know, like to say if it were a different West last year, the Nuggets wouldn't have beat them. Um, the Nuggets wouldn't have come out the West. So I'm excited to see what they look like with their new big three of Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant, and Devin Booker. Hopefully they're all healthy come December 1st. And we can see a real matchup of who the king of the West is now that all teams are yeah. back healthy and fully loaded. Um, I'm actually I'm excited. very excited. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. I'm actually very excited about Suns at Warriors. A lot of people don't know this, but fun fact, Kevin Durant has never played at Chase Center with fans in it. So it's his first time Ooh, coming back. That's awesome. Going to Chase Center, rather, with a full arena of crazy, intense Ooh, Warrior that'll be fans fun. in a Suns jersey. That's going to be interesting. I'm definitely looking forward to that. Same thing as you, Wemby's debut. Mavs at Spurs. Definitely interested to see how he looks in his first NBA debut. Although, I'm not expecting yeah. much. I know people are putting like these crazy expectations on him. I'm I'm not expecting a miracle. I'm really not. No. I don't know if my expectations are too low. Yeah, no, I think I'm more, I think I'm also excited about like a women Yama Chet uh, matchup to kind of see what that looks like. That might be even sure. cooler than his debut just because, you know, those are two guys that I think a lot of pressure has been applied on and it's kind of a, yeah. can you rise to the occasion sort of thing? Okay, really quickly, you brought up the Suns. I have a yeah. little bit of beef with these um, nationally televised games this season. <laughs> Tell me why the Suns have more nationally televised games than the NBA champions. Last Two season, words. the Denver Nuggets. Kevin Durant. Had... <laughs> Gross. I'm over it. Last year, the Denver Nuggets had 28 televised games. They won the championship. This year, they only have 30. An increase of two. Two games. I'm sorry. I'm in the Western Conference. It may be a little different as for you as a Knicks fan, yeah. but the Suns overhype. We see this every single season. And I talked about this. When they acquired Bradley Beal, a lot of Suns fans really excited about it. But when I look at this team from last season, they had two issues, defense and depth. 
Bradley Beal mm-hmm. does not fix those issues. So I think we're still going to see the same thing we've seen from the Suns team, which is, yeah, you got a lot of talent in that starting lineup, but try playing those three guys for a full 30 minutes every single game of the season and see how that works out for you. I don't think it has longevity throughout the entire season. So that's just my only little beef. The, the Suns having yeah. more nationally televised games is sickening to me as a Nuggets fan. I mean, the Knicks have 25. We're cool. Um, you know, everyone <laughs> loves the Knicks are good. You're TV. chilling. But I, yes, I of will course. say the defense is still an issue for me. I do think the Suns did a great job on the margins with filling in their gaps. I do think that that is going to be beneficial for them, but defense is still going to be an issue. Kevin Durant, defensively that, you know, we see when he's been put in those situations, whether it's against Boston or Milwaukee, it's not really like his game. That's not really, can he do it? Yes. Is he the best at it? No. Um, I don't think defensively they got better. I do think they're much better depth wise than they were when the Bradley Beal situation first went down. It looked like it was just going to be them playing all 40 plus minutes and never taking a break. So It is interesting to see how that's going to play out, which is why I'm so excited for that Suns at Warriors game. And lastly, look, before we close this out, Knicks Heat play-in tournament. I hate the play-in tournament, but I'm excited to see what this looks like. You know Heat-Knicks rivalry is always good TV, but I hate the tournament. It'll be nice. I hate it. It'll be nice. I'll be rooting for the Knicks if it makes you feel better. Thank you. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) We'll be back. We got Jim Trotter in the building. I love Jim. Michael Orr is looking out for himself, and it's about time. Those are the words of national columnist for The Athletic. I had to make sure I got that correctly. Let me repeat that in case you you didn't hear me the first time. National (laughs) columnist for The Athletic. He's in the building. We love him so much. Jim Trotter, can I first and foremost say I'm so happy for you? Like, it's just, uh, it, it makes me happy when I see your name, your quotes, the byline, all of that. It's just, I'm, <laughs> I'm very happy. Are you happy? I'm very happy. Number one, I'm I happy to be that. with you ladies. You know how much of a big fan I am. So we're going to have this mutual admiration society right here. So <laughs> look, I'm, I'm about to celebrate my 60th trip around this earth on Monday. Wow. And when I look back now and I see young ladies such as yourself holding it down the way that you are it lets me know that when i get out of this thing which is not too far down the line we're gonna be all right so i appreciate you all you don't look a day over 25 jim that's right that's right i wish i i I wish i felt like i was only a day over 25. (laughs) well listen i read i just read your your statement from or one of your lines rather from the michael orr story and this story has been crazy it, it's kind of come out of left yeah. field um no pun intended yeah. um it, it's it's been disheartening and it's been very much back and forth so for people who are unfamiliar with the situation a quick summary you know the blind side was a movie that sandra bullock won the oscar for she did an incredible job and it was based on the twoies who were allegedly the adoptive parents of michael orr who was this un- underprivileged kid that they kind of went ahead and put through school and then got to college and then the NFL draft. And he he ended up going to Baltimore and had a successful NFL career. And now it's coming out and there's been tidbits in between. You know, Michael Orr has said in his book and on other occasions, he did not like his portrayal for people who are unfamiliar. He was portrayed as this not that bright kid who had nothing going for him and and, you know these people changed his life but when you dig a little deeper he was a five-star high school recruit one of the best in the country so the talent was there but he is now saying that he was not aware that they did not legally adopt him but instead put him under a conservatorship the two weeks come back and say listen we put you under the conservatorship because legally we could not adopt you as an adult now michael orr's words from his book are coming back to haunt him where he is saying that he was aware of the conservatorship but he was just happy that legally in some way shape or form that it meant that they were a family that he felt they always were the two E's are also accusing him of a 15 million dollar shakedown prior to filing the suit so a lot of back and forth <laughs> a lot of he said she said i mean jim what what do you make of all of this 
Yeah, first, let me address the point you make about what Michael Orr said in his book. And it's funny that people will cherry pick things. What he said in his book, and I'll read the quote to you from his book. He said, Sean and Leanne would be named as my legal conservators. They explained to me that it means pretty much the exact same thing as adoptive parents. Look, I don't expect an 18 year old to know what a conservatorship is. I don't expect many adults to know what a conservatorship is. And so from that standpoint, what Michael Orr said is that he was just looking to be part of a family. And they had told him that this would make them family official. So from that point, I don't hold that against him at all. There are There is a lot of, as you said, back and forth here. And ultimately what I say is, as it relates to the finances, we're gonna find out who's telling the truth because there has to be a paper trail of who received what. Mm. So from that standpoint, I'm just waiting on the probate court to go through that and look at it and then tell us, no, the TUIs were paid this for uh, the rights to the blind side, the family received this, Michael Orr received this or did not receive this. At some point that's gonna come out. In between right. what I also wonder with this is, look, if it's true that Michael Orr did not understand the meaning of conservatorship and only learned of exactly what the details are in that, back in February of this year, and his feelings maybe are now hurt that this group that he thought was family, that he called family, truly and legally is not his family. Are there hurt feelings behind this as well in, in, in this discussion of what's going on? I don't know, and none of us know. And that's why I was so reticent to write a column on this for a few days. I kept telling our place, we don't know enough to speak on this, but right. because everyone's talking about it, obviously, folks want to read about it. And so my take is, look, this guy has been exploited, in my opinion, throughout his life. When you look at what Hollywood did to him, they say based on a true story. You ladies know, based on a true story doesn't mean that every fact in that movie is true or, or every right. piece of information in that movie is true. It means that they can take a an element of it and then as Hollywood will do, make it into whatever they want for dramatic purposes to sell the product. And that appears to be what happened here, at least from what Michael is saying. So um, when Michael Lewis, the author of the book, comes out shortly after the book's released and is asked how Michael Orr is doing while at the uh, Ole Miss, and Michael, Orr, and Michael Lewis says, well, he's on the Dean's list at Ole Miss. That's, that should tell you all you need to know about Ole Miss. It sounds to me like he's there saying that Michael Orr is not very smart, yes. which anyone knows Ole Miss is a, <laughs> you, dummies don't get into Ole Miss and dummies That's don't right, make right. The, the Dean's list at Ole, Ole Miss. Right. So that to me was a shot at Michael Orr. So I'm going on here, but there are a lot of layers to it. I'm just happy he's standing up for himself and speaking his truth. Right. I, I got to say, I didn't learn about a conservatorship until Britney Spears in the past year. Right. I mean, I didn't know anything about what that entailed. And I think there's so much behind um, like was like with Britney, for example, there's we were only let into a, a segment of what was going on with her. And I kind of feel like that's how this movie is now, where it's this beautiful film that I just actually watched a month ago and was bawling by myself in my room like a baby. And I actually did a little bit of my own investigative work. And I was like, I wonder how this family is doing to find out that he's unfollowed them on Instagram. They weren't at yeah. his wedding. So I kind of knew something had to have been going on. And then when all of this started to trickle out, I was like, okay, there is way more to this story than we even realize. Honestly, now I feel like it's not the blind side, it's blindsided. Uh, I feel like yeah. that's what the name of the movie should have been. Cause I feel like that's probably how he feels at this point in time. Like he was totally what? blindsided by what that relation. I, I think I would sit there and go, what did you bring me into this family for? Was there, was right. it out of the goodness of your heart or was there an ulterior motive here? And I think for me, and, and Jim, I want to ask you this. I think for me, one of the things that like I'm so taken aback by is like, let's go ahead and implement the facts that we do know into this film, right? Instead of saying they adopted him, let's say they put him under the conservatorship because legally they couldn't adopt him. And that was told in the story. Let's say that he was a five-star recruit. He was. And you still helped him out because he was still in some way, shape, or form underprivileged. Let's put that in the story. Those facts don't make that story any less sentimental. Exactly. It makes it more exactly. authentic. It makes it exactly. true. But for me, it doesn't make it 
not still heartfelt. Like had those facts been in the story, I still would have walked away saying, wow, you know, this was a kid with so much talent, so much going for him. And this family really helped them out. This is a beautiful story. So it's icky to me that like you felt you needed to overcompensate for something that was already beautiful to begin with if you would have told the true story but before we move on from this there are but let me um let me say this to you ashley though go ahead yeah yeah let me say this to you but this is the history of hollywood right right there always has to be a white savior and that's what Mm -hmm. annoys me most even when i watched this movie originally when it came out knowing that they could say it's based on a true story, but then compromise what the true details are. There is always in Hollywood this need to have a white savior to save Black people, to save disadvantaged Mm -hmm. Black people and whatnot. And so I asked a friend, a couple of friends um, uh, the other day, I said, name me a movie or a TV show where a wealthy Black family um, takes in an impoverished white child, right? A reverse Mm. different strokes, if you will. We can't, we couldn't come up with one. We couldn't it was come Annie. up with one. I can't think of one. But yeah. it was the remake of Annie, though. Remember, Jamie Foxx was Daddy Warbucks. Yes. Oh, no, Shout but Annie was Annie. black in that. But Annie was black in that movie. Never mind. That doesn't count. See? So, so I'm saying to yeah. you, so it Hollywood is complicit in all, Hollywood is complicit in all of this. The other thing I will say to you, if, if the Tuohys had nothing to hide about this conservatorship, why well, in their know. book did they never mention the word conservatorship, but yet on at least 30 occasions referenced adoption or something that related to adoption, right? So I don't get it. If you have nothing to hide as it relates to a conservatorship, why in almost a 300-page book did the word conservatorship not come up one time? Quick question before we move on to a little bit of current football. There are accusations accusing the Tuohys of possibly being boosters for Ole Miss, and that is going to play a part. They are alums. They are accusing them of being boosters as well. Any information that you can tell us that you've done so far in researching, talking to people, any truth behind that? No, I, I can't speak to that. And that's another reason I wanted to wait for all these things to come out and, and have access to the two weeks to ask them some of these questions. So, look, it is, it, it's is—it just curious, right, mm-hmm. that they would take in this kid who has this athletic ability, comes from a disadvantaged background, and then put him in a situation where the one school he winds up at is a school that both of them attended and where the father played basketball. So... Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that there is something nefarious here, but I am saying it's just curious without knowing all of the facts. For sure. Well, we're going to definitely keep an eye on this story, but moving on, we're also keeping an eye on all of these fights going around the NFL training camp. I mean, teammates are fighting teammates. We got joint practice fights. We got Micah Parsons throwing haymakers at his own guys. I mean, Jim... Why are, first of all, if you're going to fight, take your helmet off. I mean, like, listen, protective gear and fights is kind of a cop out. But I mean, my God, football <laughs> just started. What's the deal? First of all, um, to your point about helmets, I've none, never understood why players would fight while wearing helmets. Um, and I would <laughs> never and I never understand why coaches would in any way condone a fight taking place when players have helmets on knowing that one of your key guys could end up getting hurt, breaking a hand or whatever. So from that standpoint, look, the thing that's going on here is that fights in training camp are as old as football itself. Even fights among teammates in training camp are as old as football itself. I can give you examples of when I was a beat writer, what I saw. So you're together all this time, you get a little edgy, you know, from being bored, doing the same thing over and over, (laughs) going against the same guy all the time. And then what happens is when you do joint workouts, now you have some coaches who do push the needle a little bit and tell their guys what they're looking for in terms of physicality, all of that, and think that it makes them tougher and brings them together. And we even heard Coach Prime this week talking about it's not one, it's all. All have to be in on something like this. And so you see the other guys Mm -hmm. coming in. To be honest with you, Ash, I think it's much ado about nothing. Um, I think it's, it's entertainment for us you know, gives us something to talk about. But at the end of the day, as long as no one gets hurt, it really doesn't mean much. Yeah. I Micah, just, stop throwing haymakers, man. 
please. Right. I just we have a bone you. to pick though with anybody ever out there who says that women are overly emotional. I'm going to just start pulling up joint <laughs> practice film and say, hold on a minute, because these grown men seem to be using these practices as therapy. I mean, they're taking cheap shots. Mark Andrews throwing somebody to the ground and straining their rotator cuff. I mean, listen, I have been very, I've been very emotional most of my life and I can get very intense. If Ashley and I got into it, I don't think body slamming her would ever be my go-to reaction. And listen, men are just aggressive and they get it out there. I'm just saying, I've never been to a, a practice as an athlete myself growing up where it gets this crazy. So anyone that thinks women are just too emotional or whatever, pull up some joint practice, AKA WWE film. And I think that point is officially debunked because they are just- You don't even need to just bring up joint practice. Look what James Harden did. That's emotional itself. (laughs) 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 Don't ever call me emotional. Look what James Harden just did. Absolutely. And went viral. But I mean, listen, speaking of emotional, when we talk emotions, hate is a Uh strong emotion. And Uh it's a fine line between love and hate. And Liv is definitely on the side of hate when it comes to Aaron Rodgers and the Jets. Um, Okay. I mean. No, here, listen, okay. It's Aaron Rodgers and the Dallas Cowboys this year. I don't know. I I just, it's a thing. Okay, well, it's, It's first of all, it's always the Dallas Cowboys. I will, I will, (laughs) I will raise hell to Cowboys fans till the day that I probably die. Now, I didn't Mm -hmm. realize that at this age in my life, I would find a best friend like Ashley, who happens to be a very large Cowboys fan. So it's, you know, it's put a strain on our relationship here and there, whatever, Mm -hmm. we'll deal with it. But I got to tell you, it, I, I don't even want to say, I think one thing for me working in the media and always having to talk about these teams pre NFL season, I'm just sick of having Rogers name in my mouth. It feels like he is always a headline, whether it's some fabricate, whether he's on a darkness retreat or he, you know, is wants to leave green Bay. Oh, just kidding. I'm here to stay. Oh, I might be retiring. There's always a headline regarding Rogers. And the only thing I have to say about the Rogers jet situation is to me right now it is do or die I am done talking about Rogers after this year if he doesn't have success with the Jets he's getting the hard knocks knocks attention which I think is showing a more lovable side to him now you add Dalvin Cook an elite some would argue top three defense um to me Rogers had the same offense last season with the Packers that he does this season. And I would argue he had a better O-line in Green Bay last year. So again, there's just all this hype, all this conversation. I feel like we always talk about Rodgers, but to me, you have everything you need. You're a back-to-back MVP. If you can't do it now, I think your 2011 Super Bowl win will be your last. That's how I feel. I'm just over talking about Aaron Rodgers. It just feels like it's every year. So... Sorry, that was a vent. I'll get off my soapbox Jim, and let you Jim, take it away. Are you Jim. are you are you buying the the Jets the Jets uh, stock? Are you are you high? Are you low? Where do you sit on this? See, I, I'm about to get in trouble here. I'm high on him. <laughs> I, I'm real high on him, to be honest with you. From this standpoint, number one, defensively, as you say, they are really talented. Yeah, and they had yeah. some young players there last year who are a year older, and they should be even better this year. Offensively, when you add a Dalvin Cook with with um, uh, Brees Hall coming back, that running game should be pretty good. Now, I know there are issues mm-hmm. up front on the offensive line, but what they will do is they will game plan to try and, and, and protect those areas as a weakness for Aaron. The other thing here with Aaron, and, and I understand fatigue from hearing his name, um, but when I look at him physically this year, what it says to me is that he has invested into this season. When you looked at him last year, his body, he looked like a guy who didn't put in any work in the off season and just showed up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and, and Aaron may get yeah. mad at me for saying that, but that's what he looked like. And so when I have seen him this year, not only attending OTAs and everything else, but I see how he has leaned up and is committed. And if you know Aaron, I can guarantee you that there is some he wants to he, he he wants to put this to the Packers. Let me put it that way, and mm. show them that they made a mistake. And I believe I believe he is going to have a really good year. I do because of the talent around him, the fact he doesn't have to carry the load, the fact that defensively they are so good. Um, yeah, I, I think he's going to have a really strong year, and I think the Jets are going to be right there again. 
The caveat being if they are healthy. Look, he's petty like you live there that you guys have similar similarities. You should be BFFs, you and Aaron Rodgers. I do much to Liz's <laughs> point though. She mentioned it. She mentioned hard knocks. And I think something for me that I've noticed even before hard knocks, even before OTAs, you know, during even basketball season, he's taking a different effort in his young guys than he did last year. One of the things I did not like about Aaron Rodgers last season was he had this new group of young, impressionable guys that he really had to form a chemistry with. And I don't know if he was just mentally and physically one foot out the door, but he did right. not really embrace them like he did with a Randall Cobb back in the day or a Jordy Nelson. And you're seeing him be a different type of leader this time around he's going to basketball games with these guys he's got handshakes with these guys he's wearing chains right. with these guys like it's a totally different quarterback he seems happy like he just seems like he's someone invested. who got out of a toxic relationship and just found the love of their life so before we, invested. we let he's invested before we let you go jim <laughs> listen i'm gonna i'm gonna ask for the stamp is this a Super Bowl team this year? Are they going all the way? Oh, I think they have the ability. Um, I'm not ready to say they're going to the Super Bowl. I'm, you know, truthfully, Ash, I really haven't even thought about it yet in terms of who are my two teams to pick for the Super Bowl. I'll wait to the end okay. of preseason to do that and see the rosters. But as constructed now, do they have the ability, the talent? Yeah, I think they do. Absolutely, I do. I think the couple of things here in terms of when you talk about Super Bowl, I truly believe number one, you got to have defense. Number one, or or one A, you have to have quarterback, right? You have to have elite mm -hmm. quarterback play to win a championship. I believe Aaron Rodgers is that. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's the same Aaron Rodgers as he was a few years ago. But again, I say he doesn't have to carry the load now. So they will have quarterback play. Um, they have defense. And the other thing that I love right now is that they have a running game. So, for instance, if they get up in a game in the fourth quarter and you have a defense that can perform, you can go to that four-minute offense and turn to your running game and say, Hall and Cook, take over here, chew up the clock, run it out, let's go home with the win. They, they just have, they have everything that you need right now if that offensive line plays well enough for them. Are you buying more stock in the Jets or Liv's Broncos? <laughs> Oh, I already the know Jets. the answer. Jets. I don't need to hear it. Jets I don't need to hear question. it. Back it up. Jets I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Let's ride. I think I am too, actually, Ooh. unfortunately. Ooh. <laughs> Listen, Russell's got a lot going on. A new baby oh, on the way. He's going to be okay either way. It's just the Broncos ain't riding to a Super Bowl, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no. Don't worry. And don't worry. Us Broncos fans don't believe it either. We're not, you know, I mean, I'm on the I'm on the smart side of the Broncos fan base. I don't think that's coming anytime soon. So I think I think it will change if maybe he lets his guys wear bucket hats and sunglasses. I don't know. Maybe that's Listen. what they're missing, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, we're going to get I you a bucket hat and one. some sunglasses. <laughs> I, I got it already. I got mine. Ooh. I love that. Okay, we're here. I do. Oh, no, I'm a bucket hat guy. Trust me. So cool Stephen A has been making the rounds live. And when I say cool Stephen A, I mean Stephen A laid back, sunglasses, cussing up a storm. Real <laughs> queen Stephen A, real Hollis queen Stephen A, more like Uncle yeah. Stephen A. And he was on Podcast P and, and had a phenomenal episode with, with Paul George. And the topic of new media came up. And for people mm -hmm. who don't know what that means, it's, you know, the transition from the traditional form of journalism, linear journalism, um, that we have seen, meaning, you know, the big three, the networks to now different forms, YouTube, streaming, uh, TikTok, everything in between. And this is what he had to say about it. So I want to listen to this and then we'll dissect it. With the success that we've been having in this space, mm -hmm. what's your honest take away from us being as athletes being in this content space? I'm incredibly proud of y'all. I think that there's a lot of people in the business that won't admit it, but they don't want y'all to From succeed. From a competitive standpoint? They don't want y'all to succeed. Um, but what I would ask you to consider is that have some compassion for them who mm -hmm. feel that way. I think there's room for everybody, to believe it or not. And I think that you have a lot of people that they don't believe that y'all are going to be completely authentic and honest with one another, A, 
they don't believe that you're you're really really going to invest yourself in this industry number two they think you're doing it just to kick out the fourth estate which is the media and to talk amongst ourselves and my attitude is that's your problem y'all got something to be worried about because there's people that's coming and they don't really want you to succeed but in the same breath you sort of don't have something to worry about because you got a brother like me watching y'all back. Ooh, Liv, listen. Very interesting. I am so happy that Stephen A said this. Now, it was centered, it was focused primarily on athletes in the new media, so he wasn't yep. referring to journalists in new media, but I'm sure the sentiments are the same. Now, you and I are a few years apart, so I actually went through a lot of traditional linear before getting into new media. New media just kind of popped off during the pandemic. You came mm -hmm. up in the new media space. And I know that you particularly got a lot of backlash for operating and utilizing TikTok to your benefit. And you know that oh, I get a lot of backlash for I got ripped from apart. how I dress to yep. how I dress to how I wear my hair to the fact that I am just not what Sports media has been. So hearing Stephen A say that and coming out of his mouth that there are people that do not want you to succeed. Gotta say, I'm not surprised, but it's nice to hear. I mean, what are your takeaways from that? Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, I'll tell you, I jumped into new media, but studied traditional media. TC is right. not teaching you in the communication school how to be a content creator and how to make creative reels and TikTok form videos. And, and that's not what I learned. So I learned, I studied, I got my major in a traditional style media where Same. we were hosting yeah. newscasts every, mm -hmm. every day of the week, writing rundowns, producing our own shows, getting our own B-roll, getting our, our own sound. I mean, that was what I studied. And then here comes the pandemic, right? And, and what I've told people many times, because I have been ripped apart for how I yeah. do my content. You know, when I first jumped into the space, specifically with sports betting, I was doing TikTok dances and putting my player props on the screen. Right. And people had people in the old, you know, sports betting space were so pressed by what I was doing. But guess what? It was working. And so I always told people, I'm like, listen, you are so angry that I'm growing a following and that I'm getting hired and, and I'm doing it this way, jump on the train or it's leaving you at the station because this is the new wave, whether we like it or not, because mm -hmm. any person that is interested in getting in this space has to basically have a cell phone, which most of us have confidence, mm -hmm. which it does require and the creativity to create content on your own. For a long time, what I was doing was making con content, basically not getting paid for it and just consistently posting it on my social media. Eventually it led yeah. to the jobs that I have now, but I really do appreciate that Stephen A did draw attention to the journalists and the people that have studied this traditional media. Cause I will say sometimes it's even hard for me. And I know I jumped into the new media, but the amount of classes that you had to pass and the hours you put in in college to get a major thinking that you needed that to be successful right. in media just for the pandemic to hit and all of that traditional stuff you learned to basically be thrown out the window. It can be hard. I mean, I'm my student loans are creeping up on my tail and I'm like, what do I even what do I even need school for half the time? Because yeah. it's so different. So I, I appreciate Stephen A drawing attention to the people that may be frustrated by this. But again, yeah, we're we also as consumers of media love to see the athlete perspective. And the best way to get that is for them to right. be doing what they're doing right now. And and frustrated is a nice way of saying that they're haters. And I just want to say before we get into commercial break, for everybody who told me that I wouldn't be successful if I wasn't wearing blazers and straightening my hair every day, joke's on y'all. So, ha. <laughs> okay. Joke is on Screw you. your blazer. <laughs> screw your pencil skirt. We not doing right. that. You see my hoop nope. earrings? They're big. That That's okay. We doing that. It's a new day. That's right. New day. Absolutely. New media, new day. Absolutely love it. <laughs> love your blonde hair, by the way. So cute. Blonde's Thank your you. color. Thank You're you, welcome. girl. We'll be back, guys. Ugh, listen, 
Aaron Judge, love him. Go Yankees, you know I bleed blue all day, every day. The Yankees are last in the AL East. We're not even 500. It is almost September. Ooh. Aaron Judge officially signed with Jordan Brand. Great, love that for him. But the picture pissed me off because we are last in the AL East. He recreated <laughs> Jordan's picture, except there are no oh. rings on his finger, except for the one that has the Jumpman logo on it. I get it. The timing is pissing me off, Liv. Like we are last, last Listen. in our division. You know what this kind of reminds me of, but maybe a little different because I feel like the Celtics had some some success, but like yeah. I feel like everyone kind of shared this feeling with like Jason Tatum when he was like imitating like a Kobe picture and then would like lose mm. a game. There's just a level of like when you are going to emulate a actual legend, a goat if you will, you you better you better walk the walk you know like it's one of those things where i love honoring these fascinating and in incredible athletes but it, it comes with a level of pressure and the picture right, right, right. is giving honestly aaron judge's picture is giving more the rock in a turtleneck you know that picture of him in a black turtleneck with the, the fanny chain? pack yeah <laughs> it's listen, giving more the rock right now than it is jordan i i i'm not listen i'm not blaming aaron judge honestly of all of the yankees and all of our problems has been the most consistent factor he was of course for a little while but i feel like aaron judge is not the problem the timing is just messy like the yeah. yankees He's not great fuck this year we are trash or just accept like, the brand and leave the picture right. out of it or at least put some did. fake rings on i mean go go to Something. a jewelry store and get some i mean come on yeah like it didn't i don't think it hit the way he thought it was going to i just thought i just think the jump man marketing team maybe should have <laughs> thought that one through but yeah. um some news that people are freaking out about on social media right now. Elon Musk, who is determined to make Twitter, now X, the worst mm -hmm. place in America. It was already a cesspool, but now it's getting messier. <laughs> it's um, getting messy. It's saying that he wants to remove the block button. Now, if you work in media, you utilize the block button on the regular schmegular. Now, it has been confirmed though, that Apple and Google require social media apps to have a block feature. So I don't Ooh. know if they are going to even be able to remove it, but just the whole concept that he wants to like, ew. If I can't block people, I'm deleting the app, period. And I'll <laughs> leave it at that. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to threads if that's the case. See me, catch me on threads. Cause I'm out catch if I can't threads. block people. <laughs> No, but seriously, like it just, I just feel like how you already took verifications away. Anybody can buy a blue check mark, say what they want to say. Which is another thing that, that pisses me off. I'm over which that. Which to the point, even athletes are getting caught up in it. Like Elon, what is your deal? It's, it's giving very much pick me energy, Elon. Just go be rich and we, leave us alone. <laughs> how do we block him Honestly. from Twitter? Like, <laughs> yeah. how do we do that? Yeah, that's what we need I to figure block out. block him for Twitter. I thought he sold the app. Jesus, I can't. Hey, thank you for watching Brother From Another. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. Don't forget, you can catch us three to four weekdays on PeacockTV.com and on Sirius XM Channel 85.